Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 11 of Zach's Artful Podcast, the show with the most. I'm your host, Zach Cobb, and we got a wonderful holiday episode for you. No breaks, no in-between stuff. Getting straight right into it with our wonderful guest, Jonathan Hape, talking about all sorts of nerdy awesomeness stuff coming your way. So kick back, relax, and enjoy the ride. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. I hope you're all having a wonderful December day. And, well, you know, let's just hop right into it. Y'all know why we're here. Y'all saw the thumbnail. Y'all see who we're interviewing. The musical legend himself, Jonathan Hape. How are you doing today? Hello. I'm doing uh, fantastic. Today is my uh, second day of Christmas break, uh, so I'm feeling feeling wonderful. <laughs> oh, Christmas break is always wonderful, you know. Yes, indeed. Yes, it's away from the paperwork and the desk and the chairs and the mm-hmm. yelling in the All halls. The, oh, yeah. All never want to be near the chairs. Oh, never the chairs. Christmas break, Evil yeah. Evil chairs, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I've told this story before to people, um, but uh, speaking of uh, away from chairs, my so my best friend, the Adam Glass, who I collaborate with on different things, he... Uh, um, he once gave up chairs for Lent, and uh, so he spent all of Lent in the springtime uh, in not sitting on chairs, just kind of as a joke, and um, he tried it at school under religious reasons, and oh. it was very funny. It was a great, oh, that's great time. Ama- that's amazing. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> so how have you been, Zach? Uh, I've been doing quite well. Um, I've been doing a lot of uh, film and video uh, studying, I decided to become a film video major, and I'm Ooh. going into uh, screenwriting. Yeah, I. Oh, that's great. Yes, I'm very excited. I've gotten all my um, comics um, credits done, and I've. It's been an absolute blast getting to work with film and learning all these different camera techniques and uh, light working with lighting is going to be very fun. I have a lighting class. Um, coming up soon, and that's gonna be really fun. And oh, that's great! Yeah, yeah, it's been it's been super fun. I've um, I've also been doing a lot of music on the side as well. And cool. Yeah, I've gotten uh, to work with a whole bunch of different artists and trying to look, adapt to different styles. I've been trying out um, a lot of um, indie stuff a lot recently, so that's been a very cool like experiment to try out with because I usually been do, uh, I've been doing a lot of lo-fi stuff recently. Right. Yeah, so I it's been cool trying to learn how to adapt to a different style of for oh, yeah. different artists to work it's with. It's such a good practice. Yeah, always going, you know, venturing outside of your own style, which is why, you know, a lot of times musicians or filmmakers or even, you know, visual artists when they, you know, are known for a thing and then they do something different, you know, sometimes that's not met favorably, but usually whether people like it or not, the artist benefits from it and usually the following work you know is so informed by that um uh experimentation that that reaching out so that's really cool um i know you know obviously you do all of your character design and things like that and so that should serve you pretty well going into uh like doing storyboarding for your s- screenwriting you know you could yeah. you could actually be your own middleman on that and same thing with like composing for films like that just sounds like you're on the right track that's really cool yeah for sure i've been um getting to learn about all the uh, relearning about the film uh, story structuring and different ways of like uh telling the hero's journey or using the yeah. harmon oh. circle stuff yes, like that the story circle is what it's all about when i um doing film class and animation class now i'm always go into the story circle and you know um probably the most kid-friendly version of of a cartoon you know because of course you could show rick and morty or things like that and show the uh, show that or show sure. all of star wars or the matrix and show it but my favorite thing is just watching an episode of regular show and every episode follows not only the hero's journey but everything at the end is you know kind of wrapped up and boom yeah. the next episode you know, it's <laughs> it's an everything minutes, else so. is back to normal the next day like nothing happened right exactly <laughs> <laughs> so have you been i know um uh, i've known you for a long time and i know that you are a fellow fan of cartoons so like have you been watching yes. any uh good stuff recently 
You know what? I fall into the trappings of, of my, I think maybe my age or just how I view things. Cause I, I always end up just rewatching the same stuff over and over again. So, you know, every once in a while I'll try and venture out. I really wanted to watch, um, Gendy Tartakovsky's, um, Prime? uh, Primal. And oh, I'm not. Yes. It's so Is good. It good. It's okay. so good. You got to And everybody it raves about it. So yes. I, I definitely want to see that. Um, but I haven't sat down with this. So, you know, usually I'm just watching Venture Brothers, like, for the billionth time. Uh, um, there's always more to find. And, and at, at a certain point, it's so familiar to me that, like, it feels very comfortable. So I'll just keep watching that. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm trying to think of anything else. Uh, you know, I always go towards, you know, Futurama or the old Nickelodeon stuff. Yeah. Sometimes I've been trying to dig up, um, like, it coming up into christmas um uh there's something called claymation christmas which was will vinton Ooh. um it's the guy that did the california raisins and he did the adventures of mark twain and yeah. he uh yeah and he, uh craig um bartlett who did uh hey arnold he worked on all of will vinton stuff a bunch of people that worked on this new uh pinocchio the Guillermo. uh uh, Guillermo, Guillermo del, del Toro, Toro movie. Yeah. yeah. A bunch of people on that also worked with Will Vinton, if I'm remembering correctly. And um, yeah, so he, he did this Claymation Christmas and it has the California Raisins, but it has all like just a bunch of other really kind of like semi creepy characters. Uh, oh, it, it's really neat. So I'll watch stuff like that, things I haven't watched in, you know, 20, 30 years or something, yeah. really trying to remember it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I I do the same thing as well. I usually like going back to seeing an old show and kind of like noticing little details that I haven't, uh, that I didn't yes. see on like first watch. Um, like, uh, I recently went back and watched, um, Clone Wars on, okay. uh, and that, yeah, it, it's, it's still just as good as it, uh, as it was. Cause I, I didn't get into it at first when it came out. Cause like I wasn't b super big into Star Wars at the time. So, and, like, it was premiering everywhere. So it's like, why is this Star Wars thing interrupting me watching Chowder? Like, why? Right. Why should I watch it? <laughs> but, like, as soon as I got to Star, uh, Star Wars and uh, uh, my friend Becca, uh, like, we watched, started watching Star Wars. And I started watch, uh, going back to it and, like, yeah, it's really good. It's so it's, good. That's the CG um, yeah. one, the yes. computer graphics one. Yeah, yeah. And I haven't seen that, and everybody, you know, kind of raves about it now. At the time, I didn't hear much about it, but um, I know that, again, with the Gendy Tartakovsky, his his version I saw when it originally aired, and I haven't seen since, the micro episodes of Clone Wars. Oh, but, um, yes, yes. Yeah. But I haven't seen the CG one, so that's cool. I uh, Again, it, it seems like that's one that is rewarding so oh very much so that like, definitely one of the few highlights of the prequel era for sure oh that's cool that's very cool getting to learn about like having that not like yeah that clone wars and the clone wars kind of like get bridging the gap in between the stories to kind of like make that transition of anakin spiraling feel a lot more natural than how it happened in episode three he just like immediately immediately kills yeah. off samuel jackson <laughs> um, yeah yeah that's good i'm glad that there's something kind of in there to make that make a little more uh, emotional sense for sure yeah I, i've um really been enjoying like i really enjoy shows that are like very character focused and yeah. getting to see it uh, like the journey of how they progress with the, uh how they progress over the story and how they end up changing over time i just really think that's interesting to kind of learn their psyche and kind of like and just knowing how they process stuff in in that uh throughout the events of the story right oh yeah yeah whereas like you know something that's fun to watch like uh even you know talking about uh something classic like scooby-doo you know there's no arc there's no character development there's nothing like that whereas you watch like you know, on the way other end, like as something else that my wife and I have been, uh, my wife Casey and I have been rewatching a bunch lately is Bojack Horseman, and that is mm. something that is, is specifically just character arc and everything holds from episode to episode, and and that's another one. If you we've been we've watched it a lot of times in the past, so yeah. uh, watching it now, if you look in the background, there's always not just animal puns that we saw before, but but different things happening in the background to animals, like a, a uh, at a party, a snake. You know, they're kind of anthropomorphic 
yeah. animals. And, uh, and a snake, like, eats an entire cake, and then you just see the whole cake shape, like, in oh, its, its neck, yeah. you know? Or, <laughs> or a camel drinks an entire pitcher of water, and the hump grows as they, <laughs> you know? It, it, just, it just whole bits happen in the way background if you just watch the whole thing and um it, it, so not only do you have the character that that builds and uh a lot of the you know very dialogue based humor and things like that but then you have tons of little visual things you can look at and just laugh at and i i yeah. think that's you know remarkable and and kind of I was wondering if there were even different writers, like sets of writers, like, all right, this group is only going to write the jokes that happen in the background. Right, right yeah. <laughs> that have nothing to do with the episode. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I, I really like uh, finding those little things out. Like, I, uh, when I first, uh, when I, uh, re-watching Daria, um, I kind of noticed the way, um, tw- it was mainly towards uh, the... Um, later half of the season when um, uh, um, when uh, Daria's friend and her brother uh, often hang out with their um, hang out with um, Daria's parents cause, so they, they act a lot more like they have a different uh, relationship with them because they kind of okay. felt like more of like parent figures to them than their own parents did because <laughs> their par- uh, Jane's parents um, very very forgetful of their kids and they don't they often like neglect them a lot to go to oh things so, yeah so it's just very interesting to kind of see little touches like that that makes a, a like a small moment like that much more impactful throughout the overall uh series yeah and and it's funny you're talking about daria because that's something of my you know more my generation i was i was born in 84 you know huge mtv generation there and um but i didn't we didn't have mtv my my parents always made sure it wasn't like on the tv that we had so um because they would just like block the channel so i yeah. never watched daria and i still haven't gone back and watched it oh, um, man. which is really sad because that is also an era that I really enjoy anything I have seen from MTV or gone back and watched, or obviously all the Nickelodeon, anything Viacom of that era, I really like and had kind of something to say or was, you know, pushing against something. And I know Daria was kind of the, you know, the other side of like Beavis and Butthead. Beavis and Butthead was being as dumb as possible yes. to make make a point and entertain but to make a point much like king of the hill wood and his other projects but then you have on the other side daria which was just like hyper smart and super yeah, sarcastic and, yes right and so you didn't have to um <laughs> the people that follow daria weren't like the people that follow beavis and butthead there, there were some like a cross section but i feel like a lot of people took beavis and butthead more like seriously like this is a way to act whereas daria <laughs> if you if you did that that might be even beneficial because <laughs> you know you are having a little more of a critical eye towards things so <laughs> yeah yeah uh what what show do you personally feel like um i mean like you try to get into a show that you just don't get like you can cut. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's happened with me a lot. Uh, very often, um, I'll watch something that a lot of people have recommended or that I think, or have an expectation of because of the people that made it, um, there was, Oh my gosh, what is the name of that show? Uh, there was a show on Netflix that Nick crawl did, uh, like, Oh, big, big mouth. Yeah, Big Mouth that I just couldn't get into. It was funny, and there were things I enjoyed, but I just never stuck with it anytime yeah. I tried. Um, really, BoJack would have been that way for me if my if Casey hadn't have shown me anything past episode six, and then it was like, boom, I yeah, I've, I've, clung to it. Yeah, I usually heard from a lot of my friends that like BoJack that the first few episodes aren't really that a good first impression. Right. It's a weird first impression. And, and in fact, when you go back, it fits in with the rest. But for some reason, like the flow, you're, you're not introduced to the flow. The flow is just there. And so you, yeah. you kind of don't know where to step in or where it's going. And so you have to get a little further in to, to see that. And it's not too far in, but it's far enough that if you aren't like patient with a, what's supposed to be a funny cartoon, right. you know, yeah. like, <laughs> and, you know, uh, recently i don't know there's there's so much that i just don't watch because 
the things that I love, I love, and I love them passionately, yeah. and I watch them over and over again. And so for me to venture out is is difficult, unless it's, like, informative. Like, anything um, uh, new that's come out, you know, documentary-wise, or, you know, like uh, McCartney doing this thing with Rick Rubin, where they just, mm. like, are kind of going through all McCartney's stuff through the Beatles and his stuff. And they're just short little episodes, and um, Rick Rubin's acting like he doesn't know what half of the stuff that Paul McCartney is talking about right. is because because he's a good host, and so he's like, you know, oh, yeah. like Yeah, totally. Whoa, no even, idea. Right, even yeah. though he's like a world acclaimed producer who like obviously knows these right. things you know but, <laughs> like, but he's a good liaison to you know between the audience and and you know the show but uh you know things like that i could just put that on anytime it doesn't matter if it's brand new or if it's um something foreign to me if it's informative i'll watch it yeah um and i'm really I'm, because i get stuck in these you know um ruts it's hard for me to think outside of them like even when i think about music there was a time that I feel like I listened to only music that was new and innovative and weird and like, you know, completely challenging to listen to. And then like, so I kind of thought, oh, well, I only listen to weird stuff or I only listen to experimental music. And then as of a few years ago, I'm like, you know, I listen to weird stuff, you know, nothing you've ever heard of, just mostly Miles Davis, Bob Dylan, the Beatles, you know, like literally the right. biggest. The biggest <laughs> acts, that, right. Yeah, that everybody knows, like, you know, that, <laughs> that, that, that and there's reason for people knowing them. There is, you know, a lot of integrity there. It's not like, you know, just a pop star or something. But it's funny to be like, I know I kind of just settled in a little bit to yeah. the stuff that is, like, <laughs> just good, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and my version of that and other people's is very different. But when it, com- when it comes to, like, TV or, or, or media or, or visual arts or performing arts, but when it comes to music, I tend to now sway more towards pop not popular but uh classic like, yeah i guess you know That's, yeah i i kind of felt that way when i um because like i grew up listening to a whole bunch of like motown r&b stuff like that through my uh gospel music through my family and That's awesome <laughs> yeah i i so like i grew up listening to stevie wonder um songs in the key of life all the time that was like my go-to album to like listen to anything and then yeah. the more i like ventured onward to like learning about like michael jackson because i had no idea who he was um at that time um, Wild. Yeah, yeah like i was like <laughs> eight years old when like he pa- when he passed away so like i had no idea who the heck he was and like everyone was making like such a big deal i was like oh uh who who yeah, <laughs> so that's so funny putting it in context because when I was eight years old, he had just put out the black or white single. Oh, you yeah. You know what I mean? Like he was so <laughs> he was so relevant at that time. Oh yeah. You know, like he was he was still a couple years away from kind of uh, not having any more big hits or yeah. you know like really getting under you know like uh, the headlines with scandal or getting married to like El- Elvis's, Elvis's daughter. daughter. You know, like yeah. all that stuff was it was uh, down down the pike but at the when i was eight yeah i I, so i couldn't imagine that being you know such a thing where yeah he kind of just had disappeared or been in another country or just been locked up in his place and then all of a sudden he dies and you're like who is this (laughs) This, tell me about this mystery man 30 years yeah (laughs) mystery man yeah Yeah, i I, (laughs) my friend my friend had like a dvd that she would bring to like my church summer camp of like of Michael Jackson music videos and the I remember it was specifically the thriller music video and the black and white music video that like scared me the yep. most like with thriller you know it, it was the werewolf scene but like it wasn't like the spot that you would think would freak me out <laughs> like it wasn't the face transformation part that scared me it was the hand stuff where like the nails were going out like oh I was so terrified. Like I wanted to crawl, like just hide under the table, just look away. So no, just stop it, skip that. Fast forward, I was like, no, I want to watch it. So the 
the most insane way to connect these things together. Will Vinton, the guy from the, that made the California Raisins, that did the claymation special I just talked about, yeah. did the video for Speed Demon and oh. for Michael Jackson's Speed Demon, and that used to be on a, I assume, laser disc or maybe VHS at my dad's work uh, when I was a little kid, and I would be like, "Oh, can I watch that?" But it scared the heck out of me when the when the rabbit like yeah. is, is dancing, and then all of a sudden like the mountain turns into like the, the rabbit. rabbit. <laughs> And it's so it. quintessential uh, Will Vinton style. It looks like California Raisins. Yeah. Stuff, all that stuff. And I was just, I was always so freaked out. I had to watch it, but I would get so scared about that part. <laughs> but I, let, me, let me guess. With black or white, the part that scared you, was it um, uh, when he was morphing into different people? Or? Oh, no. It was, it was when he, like, he was, like, it was... I don't, like he was more f- like it was it like it does like quick cuts in between when he does the ha ah! like screaming thing yes. and it, it cuts between the panther sound effects and then just him smashing up cars and tearing his shirt and it's like I thought he was having like a breakdown and <laughs> Like, uh, should I be here? Should I? Sh- I feel uncomfortable. <laughs> Why are they filming this Why? right now? Obviously, someone help wrong. this man. <laughs> Stop stop if he's going crazy. Oh my gosh. Yep. That's Oh uh, yeah. That makes I, sense. It's all coming you know, together. <laughs> it all connects together. You know who who would have knew? Who would have thought? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I you brought you brought up Speed Demon cuz I yeah, it was in um yeah, it was a movie that he did called A uh, Moonwalker cuz that yes. that was the scene it was in. And the first time I watched it I didn't know what the heck the the bunny was supposed to be. I thought it was like a bunny version of like John Travolta. Right. So I was right, like, yeah. I thought he was like, it was gonna be like a grease thing where like it was John Travolta's voice was gonna come out the rabbit, and, <laughs> and I, I was not expecting the the Noid to be on like the tour bus chasing after him. It's like, what is this movie? Yeah. What so, is so going the Noid on? Is in- the Noid is in, in Moonwalker? Yeah, he that was... that makes sense, because the Noid was also Will Vinton. So, that's so funny. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I mean, the the fact that, like, A, people put out movies of music videos. And I know Michael Jackson was the originator of it, but other people did, too. I remember... Yeah. Um, uh, growing up, listening to, you know, I, I listened to, like, alternative stuff, and I liked that, but at some point, like, my family, we all transitioned to listening to, like, Christian music in the 90s, mm-hmm. and at the time, there was this guy named Carmen, and he would release these, like, VHS that were, like, feature-length films that had oh, music wow. videos for every song, and they were all acted out, but, like, some of the songs were just, like, sketches with like um you know satan talking to some like bureaucrat demon about trying you know it was just always yeah. so weird and convoluted and how they would tie the music videos together it really, yeah like, didn't all together make sense you know what i mean like, <laughs> yeah no i get you yeah just like trying to be as big as my big and scale right got. yeah we got yeah we got to make the next thriller you know we got to top yeah. keep topping everything but it's about a boxer and like he fights the devil or whatever you know like it's, that it's makes really sense. No sense you're right yeah that's it that's it yeah um, you know like, somebody storyboard it i need the dp over here right and, to, like just the effects everything. team on this you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah i i found a theory of um uh for uh, uh donald glover like hit the music videos that he did around um uh because the internet like the mm-hmm. these albums both tied into the screenplay that was centered around the album, and they kind of told, like, their own little story about, like, uh, being uh, an alien invasion. Like in, okay. Like, in one music video, like, you can kind of see where, like, Donald's limping because he has, like, kind of a bite mark on his ankle, and then that kind of starts to take over in the, um, uh, in the next music video that he did where, like, he kind of transforms into this alien, then the next one he's, like seeing multiple copies of himself around uh, in the in a restaurant, like multiple versions of him in like different costumes okay. based on the people that are in the diner. And then in the uh, 3005 music video and in the background, you can kind of see like this alien invasion happening in the background. <laughs> it's just, just building on top all these different layers that build on top of this already confusing like storyline about him playing a rich kid that wants to like, 
learn about connection in like a digital era. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so like That's I just yeah, uh, and, and, but the movie obviously is never gonna be made, or no, it's like just a, yeah, just an it, idea. Yeah, it's it's it kind kind of like it it has a screenplay, and there's like little tiny shot like shots that are recreated of the screenplay that okay. are out there. But like it, yeah, it's not like a necessarily like movie movie in itself. It's more so like like a series of events that kind of like are trying to be narratively structured into each other and then kind of adding in little bits of like the, the character kind of like talking to himself and kind of venting his thoughts okay. into the screenplay. It's not like a straightforward, like storyline, like point A to point B kind of thing. Okay. And yeah, like the whole idea of it is kind of like, of learn him kind of learning about how nothing matters and like, uh, like, about connection about trying to better your you're allowed to better yourself um um over like if you want to kind of thing and then yeah. the story just kind of ends with like this idea of like the boy made the whole story up just to troll because like the the uh, um uh internet's the biggest troll of it all and the jokes that he showed <laughs> up yeah <laughs> yeah wow of course, conceptual things from Donald Glover. Of course, Nothing. you know, wouldn't expect anything better. You know? Exactly. Yeah. So, what's going on with Atlanta? Do you know? Like, uh, is it, he... Yeah, it ended. It ended. Um, oh. Yeah, it ended like a few weeks back. Yeah, I was not expecting it to like end so suddenly. Because like, I, he announced a while after, like the season three and four were filmed like back to back within each other. So it kind okay. of felt like a lot less structured with the sto- overall narrative compared to like the previous seasons of the show. Right. And like he was hyping it up on this Twitter that he rarely uses. Uh, was talking about, yeah, this is going to be on some like Sopranos level stuff. They can't touch us. This is going to be great. And then season four was like, in my opinion, like the most mid that the show has ever been. Uh. Yeah. But like it's not horrible, it's not the worst. Of TV that I've seen, like there are good episodes, and I like the idea of like it being more anthology based than like narratively structured. Like I think that's fine to like take a break, but they set up this storyline about Al Touring in the previous season. And I thought it would be a really cool idea, like cool to kind of see, uh, uh, explore a new environment and kind of see how the right. characters will grow within that area. And like I thought that would be cool, but no. We just get random stories about um, biracial kid just trying to get the uh, black pass so he can get a scholarship at a school, and then oh my gosh. and then the the story about uh, the the first episode based on like a very sad uh, case about uh, kids that were adopted by this crazy couple that like dro- drove into the uh, the river with them because like they believed in like uh, cult beliefs. I believe. Okay. Yeah, so, like, it, it kind of, like, told a different version of it. Like, one of the kids ended up surviving and went back to his foster Because the whole reason that he gets adopted by his parents because, like, his parents gave him up after he yelled at him for dancing in the classroom because his teacher uh, told the class they were going to go see Black Panther 3 in the show. And, and I knew that was, like, pairing uh, uh, this video based on the uh, classroom dancing of uh, this meme of the, yeah this uh, this uh, meme of <laughs> kids dancing in the classroom when they got Black Panther tickets and his little kids like dancing on the table and everyone's going yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah and I'm I'm interested because I don't think I've seen season three uh, of Atlanta either and so I, I'd like to watch the next two but there's something about TV shows that if their first season is mind-blowing and phenomenal rarely does the show stay at that level yeah. usually it kind of slowly moves it maybe it's going to be good and then it kind of you know peters out a little bit yeah. whereas i feel like shows whose first season is just kind of you know middling or like okay usually the are builders and end up having yeah, yeah have like even a better large, seasons after yeah it. yeah and therefore there's something to look forward to the next time around and you know they have longevity you know a little bit more um 
like which is kind of something that even like uh, uh, Bob Dylan and like other other artists have talked about, which is like not giving everything away all at once. Yeah, and you know because a lot of whether it's you know somebody doing a movie, you know, it's their first movie, or somebody doing uh, a record or whatever. A lot of times, um, people will just like have everything that they've culminated over the years. It's kind of like a best of of all their thoughts until they got to this point. And you do one thing, and then after you do that, what do you do? Everything else, yeah. you either have to come up with something new or like pick up things you've kind of scrapped because they didn't work. And sometimes that can be good, or or sometimes you should just kind of hold off on some of those best ideas you had until the next thing. You know, exactly. Like, you everybody know. just wants to show off right away instead of kind of easing into something because uh to uh, yeah, a lot of times attention spans are like that it, it's either you got you got me now yeah so you better wow me you know so right you know I that, that first impression that. you know uh, is is the very important yes I think. yeah yeah whereas if you listen to that very first bob dylan record he does a bunch of covers and doesn't sound like him and it's you know there's good stuff on it but like if there's nothing classic and then you listen to the second album and it's freewheeling bob dylan and everybody knows almost oh, every song on yeah. it you know so he he just kind of and he recorded them you know a couple months apart but the first album he was like nope not gonna do all this i will i will just do some of my friends songs was, right. what a weird move yeah <laughs> yeah that kind of reminds me of, like the beatles like kind of how their their first album was like essentially covers of songs and then later yeah. on they started adding more of original stuff into their discography and then exactly it's kind of started dropping off from that have you, have you ever seen the movie That Thing You Do? Um, I've heard of it. I've not seen okay. it. I highly I highly recommend it. It's very funny. Um, uh, Tom Hanks made the movie, and he is uh, plays like kind of the Brian Epstein sort of character that was the Beatles manager. And, um, yeah. It, it's just kind of an American Beatles story, but A, very funny. B, the music in it is fantastic. Um, the the I think bassist and head songwriter from the group Fountains of Wayne um, actually did the music for it, did the main song, That Thing You Do. And he actually passed away in, in 2020 from COVID. Oh. And he, he's only in his, like, you know, 40s or 50s maybe. But oh, wow. um, I don't know if you know Fountains of Wayne. They uh, I've heard of Fountains of Wayne, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, it was actually uh, watch the new Guardians of the Galaxy Christmas special. Yeah. Uh, there's a song of theirs in it called I Want an Alien for Christmas that oh, I love. Oh, yeah, yeah. Just when they're going through Kevin Bacon's house and, like, making a mess of it, chasing him around, that song plays, and it's, <laughs> yeah, hilarious and great. Yes. I uh, Leave it up to James Gunn to, like, always make the most obscure th- song you can think of fit so well narratively and into something like you would perfectly. never... Th- yeah, you like would never perfectly. think of that specific <laughs> song to go with that scene. And, like... like yeah. <laughs> Oh, uh, speaking of Guardians, uh, how are you excited for three? See, and that's uh, so. So Casey keeps me informed about uh, <laughs> goings on and things because I'm really bad at. Um, I don't know. I guess keeping up with anything. Uh, so like, there's something I do where to not set my expectations somewhere that they shouldn't be. I tend to like not watch trailers. I don't watch. <laughs> I don't. I don't. I don't yeah. read any of the news. And then, like, when it, somebody's like, "Oh, hey, the new whatever's out," I'm like, "Let's do it." And I will have no clue, yeah, what you know the hype about it is. And it it keeps me really kind of free from being it's disappointed. Like yeah, and it it makes me more excited to see what I'm gonna see. You know, like yeah. It, and obviously there are trailers that give a lot away and there are some trailers that it's like, obviously yeah. it's these characters I know and that's it. Yeah. You know, more so a teaser funny. of it. Right. Yes. And I'm, and I'm all about that at the same time. I don't know. There's something more personal about just being like, all right, let's just go let's... and see it instead of just like being at const like showing multiple big parts of it out of context. Right. Right. <laughs> oh yeah. Which could make or break something for me. It can take a joke that is genuinely funny and would normally make me laugh, but because I'm such a contrarian, if it's the part that most people know and will laugh at the most, I won't find it funny, And it, which is such such a stupid thing I do. But it's no, just I how, my, how I work, you know? <laughs> no, I, I feel the same way. I was the same way when um, the, the, the first Amazing Spider-Man came out. I thought that Knives, that, 
that uh, the small knives joke was hilarious, but they kept using that in almost every single trailer that they had yeah. for this movie. And then when I saw it, like it, it, I like I chuckled, but it wasn't like as impactful of a joke. Now that I've heard it like five bajillion times <laughs> <laughs> after hearing it, like I didn't, I didn't know what was gonna happen after the joke. I thought that was that was also funny, but like yeah, the overall joke just felt. In, not as impactful because like they kept showing that one specific joke over right. and over again yeah yeah you can definitely oversaturate um with with even you know the too much of a good thing thing is is real you know it's what can take the uh again you know i parallel everything between music and everything but like it can take the best song on a record and if it becomes the single and then is an overplayed single it will be become your least favorite song on an album right. because you've heard it so many times and, and it takes away the exploration it's not part of the album anymore it's more part of the the public consciousness which right. can also be really cool because everybody else likes this thing so you can like it too but after a while it just becomes a little less special because it's so out there and it's not like i said it's personal so yeah for sure well, speaking of music, I know that you yourself have been involved with many, many projects from Room and Board, your new band Nero and Arrow, and your solo material. What would you say personally has been like your creative process, depending on like uh, if it's a group project or like a solo project? Oh, wow. So um, I wrote and recorded all my own songs since I was in sixth grade and I would play all the instruments, drums, bass, and guitar and do vocals. And so by the time I was playing in bands, um, I was either a co-songwriter where, okay, here's my songs and here's how to play them. And I sing. And then the other singer would do the same, or it was my band where I just, you know, I write all the songs. I would sit down and show people the parts. And that's, that's when I was you know, younger. Um, yeah. and because I had, I had the stuff recorded, so I would, I would have already played it all. And it's like, here's how it goes. And, you know, I spent a long time doing that. And then, so I joined, uh, uh so room and board started in like 2010 or yeah, 2010. Yeah. Um, Nair era started in about 2013. And around that time, I was also in a group called Safe Kept as the bassist and later the drummer. I was in um, Montauk Trash as the producer and drummer. I was in. I was playing with these guys, uh, Tony and Dan, around town. We would play like club gigs, and um, it was interesting because I had to learn how to just kind of be a a backseat member of a band, you know, and yeah. maybe sometimes be able to write, but a lot of times, you know, playing parts. So I had, to, I had, it was the first time I really got a taste of both sides of it. Um, I also toured, um, you know, for a long time with a, a guy named John Rubin and that was playing bass and that was fun. Cause it wasn't like a band thing. He was hip hop and, you know, producers would make the music and I would just pick out a bass line and, you know, play it. So that was totally different. You know, it was just, here's the CD and learn it. So, getting all those things together now i feel like i'm able to kind of flow between those those ideas but i, I mean to be honest i'm a control freak and i really like even though i have my own limitations compared to other musicians i know who like oh somebody's gonna play a way better keyboard part than i could or yeah. even you know do drums better than i could i like having the the speed and control i have over it so i can say all right everything's here and it's done yeah, it's doing things your way it. Yeah, and there's a certain point where that becomes really tiring and nothing's challenging you. And so, you know, I like being able to go between both of those worlds. Um, doing this new record with my dad was really fun because I originally we were supposed to kind of make an album together where we co-wrote everything and we each played guitar and I played drums and he played bass and then we both did vocals. And um instead it was during the pandemic uh late 2020 so things that were kind of opened up and about to close again and i woke up one day and i was just like i want to make an album and i want my dad to play on it so mm -hmm. i ended up recording within a couple weeks and wrote some songs and i recorded all the drums and guitar and vocals and then I just left everything else open for my dad to kind of come in with other background vocals, guitar parts, and mostly bass. And um, so that was really cool to just be like, all right, you do whatever you want. Right, you and know? then I'll it, fill in the rest of it. Yeah, exactly. So, like, very little things to edit or change or say. It was just like, 
you do you, and that was really cool. Oh, that's awesome. So, like, I don't know if you answered it or not, like, what, what would you say, like, your what's your creative process like when working on a song? I mean, it really depends on what it's for with the stuff that I um, write. Essentially, I just grab a guitar and I kind of I kind of have to sing and play at the same time and I sing kind of gibberish and I kind of play gibberish until things start feeling right sometimes if I map out a song entirely in my head which I used to do a it takes up too much brain power to hold on to it and b it never turns out right so I have to do something within the moment which is why I usually don't write until I have a project in front of me like, yeah. I won't just say, you know what, I need to write a song. I, I always say I have to write a song for A, B, or C. Is it an album? Is it a, a specific show? You know, what am I doing it for? And then whatever comes out, comes out. Um, the less preemptive intention, kind of like kind of like the expectation thing with the theater, the less uh, preemptive intention I have going into it, the better because whatever comes out the other side is something I'm fully invested in, in that moment. Um, and then usually I'll just take it from there and, um, build up a drum part or a bass part, or just listen to the demo and kind of, then I'll create these parts in my head and then try and replicate them. Um, so that's with that, with glass cassette, which is something I do, um, which is like an EDM project. I, I made from like a bunch of old, cassettes of uh like my high school choir group from like 2000 or like old um french uh assignment tapes or yeah. weird old vhs from tv like old news programs and stuff i just basically would take one thing and sample it and see what it felt like or sounded like and then i would i would just record um you know, hitting tools together or, or a tape measure or something like that and, and record that and kind of snip them together and do a beat and just build all these kind of sounds on top of each other and yeah. s see what worked. So I guess kind of the same sort of thing. I just kind of throw everything I have within me up against something and, and see if it's something that's usable. If you it know? works or not. Right, exactly. If yeah. I like it, if if it came naturally, how, you know, there are some songs that come out in two minutes and there are some that sure you might get one part down one day, yeah. but they don't get fully realized for a couple of years too. So there's always things on the back burner that you can pull out um, every once in a while, but I've been really wanting to do some writing mm. based on uh, something called, um, uh, I believe it's called, uh, it was created by Brian Eno um, the producer, and he worked with, like, I think, like, a French or German artist. Okay. And, oh, it's called Oblique Strategies. And it's a series of cards that just say these kind of um, ridiculous, weird, vague things. Yeah. So that when you get, like, writer's block, um, you get writer's block, you just... I have an app version, so I can just shake it. So if I if I shake this... Let's say I have writer's block and I don't know where to go in a song. Well, it says, tape your mouth is literally the <laughs> instruction. Okay. So oh, cool. I could take that as record my mouth and use my mouth as the instrument. Um, it could be literally tape my mouth shut. Um, it could be, I could take that to mean anything. So let me try a different one. All right. Uh, in the middle of writing a song and I look down and it just says... Okay. Balance the consistency principle with the inconsistency principle. Mm. Uh, so basically, I would interpret that as, okay, I want this part to be really straight, but it should kind of morph the whole time. It should never be the same, right. even though I'm doing the same thing. So, like, it's just a... I would love to write an entire, you know, and many bands have David Bowie did the talking heads. And I think you too. And a lot of people, Brian, Eno produced, um, they would use oblique strategies simply to, to get out of writer's block. Right. So, uh, what, how, um, uh, like what initially, like, uh, were you, um, self-taught with instruments or like, were you, uh, take lessons to kind of learn how to like build upon your skill set as a musician. Yeah, never took lessons. I was completely self taught. Um, in fourth grade, okay, in second grade, I had a Casio keyboard, and me and my friends 
were really into uh, Criss Cross. And so we made a bunch of like uh, rap songs using like oh, the, like, yeah, but uh, we were called the Weird and Wacky Warriors. Um, and I still have that tape and yes. that's really fun. Oh, yeah. And so two years later, I was at a garage sale and um, there was a guitar. Uh, so this was in 94, fourth grade. Um, there was a, a K Vanguard is what it is. Just a red guitar, electric guitar. And I asked how much it was and they said 75 cents. And so my mom bought it and I started writing and recording songs, um, in fourth grade in fifth grade, my dad used a Tascam four track tape, uh, recorder, which could, you know, it was a multi-track recorder and we would, he tracked some of my earlier songs. And then in sixth grade, I'd been playing guitar for like two years, just completely, you know, even though my dad plays guitar, he just, you know, if I had questions, he would answer them, but he never pushed. And so right. in, six, in sixth grade, he, uh, I got a drum kit and he did teach me how to do something called sound on sound recording. And uh, so you would have like a boom box with two cassette tapes in it. And one side would play and one side would record. It's how you used to be able to dub tapes. And so there were two cassette players in one. And then it also had a microphone in. And so you would use the microphone in and the record side and you would record the drum part. And then you would take that tape and put it in the play side. You would take another tape to record on. And as you recorded, let's say, the bass or guitar, and you would be playing the drum tape into the other tape. So yeah. I could play drums and then bass and then guitar and then do vocals and there it was so really the only time i i ever asked and my dad taught me that so i was taught how to do audio engineering then um just a you know early stages that i was formally trained on later but music i remember being eighth grade had played guitar for four years at this point had been recording and writing songs for two years and i i wanted to play on kind of like the uh it was like the christian club that met at our school in the mornings and they mm. had music and i wanted to play guitar for that but i had no chords so i asked my dad what some chords were and he taught me the names of them and their positions and i practiced those and you know that was kind of that was kind of the extent of the lessons <laughs> I've, ever, <laughs> I've ever gotten so um you know, and then just learning, you know, learning from uh, usually not even the people I listen to. I usually yeah. normally learn more from the people I play with or have toured with or have seen in other bands and really respect how they uh, work their instrument. And, yeah, you know, so uh, everything I've everything I've done, I'm just self-taught. I'm teaching myself saxophone and have been for a couple, uh, oh. I would say years now, but I only play for like a month at a time and then I'll put it down for eight months and then another month. So really it's only been a couple months. <laughs> uh, Mr. Jonathan jazz Christmas album. Oh, that's what I'm hoping. I, oh. I actually, so I have a stand up bass. I have a piano in my basement. I have my drum kit here in my basement studio and then I'm um, learning sax. So I would like to kind of sample myself playing parts and then use the glass cassette method to, to create like a, you know, Ooh, yeah. jazz album, a sample jazz record. <laughs> oh, that'd be so cool. That'd be super fun. I, I'm look I'm looking forward to that, but the time I would need to take like I mean luckily I do have a couple weeks off because Christmas break, so Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I was uh, self taught as well. My uh, friend introduced me to um uh this uh music making um on the uh soundtrack um, where like yeah. it's basically um, online studio, and I he kind of showed me how to like basically make beats uh, beats and like record audio on there, and like we yeah we we were gonna be like a rap group we we're gonna we, we already had like rap names we use like a the same uh, Wu Tang name generator that oh Donald my gosh. used That's <laughs> so I got Insane Mastermind and he got C M Marco on it and. So I just kind of like messed around with it and um, just started, yeah, just making random stuff and see which song, which sound would work best as a song itself. And then the more and more I kind of started taking it a lot more seriously, the more I started to kind of get into the process of like, okay, I want this structure to be like this and then have that build upon that later on and then have it break down in this part. Just kind of like getting like it uh, building process of a song and yeah. didn't, I didn't think I'd be, 
be as like in depth with it as I thought I would. I just kind of like making up songs about going to restaurants or like <laughs> <laughs> just all this other stuff, and then uh, meeting other music, uh, meeting up with other musicians who are on the same website, talk uh, and doing collaborations with them, and kind of learning from them how to like build a song and kind of taking from that, taking their experiences with that and building, uh, doing it in, uh, uh, my version of it. And then yeah. kind of building on upon that and then having more experience with like releasing music and like having it play on like a stereo, which was like such a surreal experience for me. I never really listened to like my music in like a car stereo before oh, I was going to yeah. campus. Yeah. Like I never heard like my beats played on like a, like out like that i usually just listen to it in my earphones so like, yeah it was so weird to hear how like nice it sounded and like having that out of body experience with that so that's cool yeah i really really uh really like that so i hopefully continue to like adventure onward into the very wide amazing wide world of um, indie music one day yeah uh, yeah so i've been also listening to a lot of folk music as well uh, yeah, the, it was a it was a duo called um, Collective Currents. It was there. It was a it was it was a trio. Well, it was originally a duo, but then they added a third person towards like the end of the group. Mm -hmm. And like as soon as I found out about them and like really loved their sound, they announced that they were breaking up. Uh, no, oh, no, <laughs> no! I need more. I love this EP. Right. It's so good. Why why would you do this to me? But yeah, it was <laughs> just kind of learning about like how different, like how different people interpret like uh, the the genre of something and kind of turning it into like their own thing. Kind oh, of definitely, like, yeah. yeah like, that's so great. Oh, it's so good. I loved it. So, what would you like? What are like your biggest music hot takes? Hot takes. Yeah. Okay. Any, any big ones? All right. So here's a hot take. Okay. Uh, in um, in March of this past year, well, a my Facebook account was um, deleted by Facebook because somebody hacked my account and they took too long oh. to uh, help me. So they decided instead of helping me that they were going to just delete my account. Mm. So. But this was a good thing only because people that I know did not learn that I have recently started really getting into the Red Hot Chili Peppers, oh, which no. for years have been a group that people have insulted and made fun of and, and still do. But, yeah. man, I love the Red Hot Chili Peppers. So that's that's hot take number one. I think Red Hot Chili Peppers, uh, I'm going to make it even a hotter take. I'm going to say Red Hot Chili Peppers are on the same level as Radiohead. What? Ooh. Boom. Okay. Okay. So, number one. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> uh, number two. Um, this is this is old news, and it is, but it's a hot take. I've learned recently. Apparently, you can't say things like this. I don't like Elvis. I don't care for hey, Elvis' music. I don't here. like Elvis. Yeah. I do like Buddy Holly and Chuck Berry and, like, other people that were of that era, usually ones that played electric guitar or, yeah. um, you know, gave a little more credit where credit was due, but not an Elvis fan, number two. Yeah. All right, let me see if I've got a third hot take in me. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, it's funny that you mentioned Elvis because, like, the only Elvis song that I even remotely like is, like, is a remix of an oh. Elvis song. It was the it was the Junkie XL remix of A Little Less Conversation. Oh my gosh. That remix slaps so hard. Oh my god. <laughs> I will have to check that out. Yes, it's so good. I love the remix. I think that's like the only time I'll even remotely like go back to an Elvis song. Cause like, yeah, out of that I I don't really care for his catalog personally. Yeah, no, I I just you know I mean, like, I get it, like, he created the idea of the rock star or pop star, but right. I, I don't know. I mean, like, I still think, even without Elvis, that the Beatles would have still done that same thing, and I yes. would have been just as happy. Or maybe Chuck Berry or Buddy Holly or, or somebody we don't know would have uh, become huge. Taking Who that knows? Mantle. yeah. Yeah, exactly. And maybe, you know, again, there's all kinds of tragedy and all kinds of things with Elvis. It's not like... I dislike him uh i'm like oh he's the worst just not a fan don't care um yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh 
any more music hot takes um i mean there's a lot of music that people love that i really don't like so i could go on about that for a while most of it's not current though it's more more things that have for others stood the test of time whereas i'm like this should have faded away years ago um so so some of that is is there uh okay maybe here's a hot take i called this this 90s resurgence happening in music and sounds and references and all that stuff when, uh, about like 10 12 years ago i was like all right in the next 10 or 12 years and like listed out all these things and whether it's music that's referencing referencing or sampling certain things right or uh going target and seeing like everything like looking like tlc i'm just mm-hmm. like what is even happening this is so bizarre but i knew it was happening so yeah. i guess that's not a hot take but uh, that's uh, it's kind of like a, i got i called it kind of thing yeah it's yeah. like a, no, i'm not surprised y'all yeah <laughs> <laughs> no i get you no, yeah those are some good takes yeah there we go I, oh man, I don't know how to, like, I guess, like, the hottest take that I have, kind of speaking of, like, like music culture as itself, mm-hmm. I don't really feel, I kind of felt like MGK kind of ruined pop punk with this, like, resurgence of, mm-hmm. of like, pop punk kind of stuff. I don't yeah. feel like it doesn't, it doesn't hit the same way that it did when, like, early 2000s pop right. punk kind of. Oh, I completely agree. I yeah, completely I feel like it's a agree. facade of it. Yeah, well, what's even more funny is that the early 2000s stuff, I thought, was a facade of the 90s stuff. So it's, ah. it's just constantly, like, replicating, self-replicating, and, like, getting further away from, like, the Ramones. Or from, you know, exactly. even, like... Or even, like, if you really want to qualify what pop punk became, when it became exactly that, I would say it was either Bad Religion's first album in the 80s or Green Day's third album, Dookie, like, the big one. That's what, like, that's, because that's a pop record done with a punk punk aesthetic. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. Yeah, that album could have come out by, like, ten different bands that year because the songs are so classic. But, and so that was the first, you know, for from what I view it as. And I feel like every single thing from that era, you know, like into the late nineties and then you have the next era and then you had like all time low and we, the Kings and all these bands that were like doing it in the like 2010s. And I just didn't get it. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I get you. Like I, I, as someone who grew up with that, in that sound and kind of seeing it brought back as kind of like a weird imitation of yes. something like, I don't know. It, like not, like it, I don't remember Blink One Eighty Two ever using trap drums, in right. stuff. So I don't know. Like, yeah, it kind of feels like someone wearing like a costume of the genre instead of like authentically re- recreating that specific. You stuff. are you are speaking my language. Right I, you know, I, I oh, yeah. you know, I understand you. I get I get you. I get you. <laughs> I don't know. I guess I'm trying to find another music hot take that I. Oh, I guess <laughs> speaking of Green Day, um. I kind of feel that Insomniac is just as good as Dookie. Okay. I, I, I don't feel like it gets enough respect that it do, uh, it, that it gets. Like I think That's it, true. I think it does a really uh, that record did a really good job of building upon that sound of Dookie, but like adding more layers onto it. Yes. Um, like um, I don't it's know. It's brainstorm on that one. Yeah, I um, think I, is it, I think. Is it Dana. Nimrod or is it Dana. Insomniac? Okay. Dunna, yeah. Dunna, Dunna. Yeah, Dana. I love that song. I, the the ad, uh, the transition from that song into the next track is so seamlessly good. Yeah, I that's lo- on that's on uh, Insomniac for sure. Insomniac, yes. yes, I love that album. It's so good. I don't I don't feel like yeah it it wasn't as like critically praised like Dookie was uh, when it came out, but like now it's kind of like being. Like it kind of gained like a fa- uh, cult, uh, a fan following. That's cool. Over the years, so yeah, yeah I, I appreciate it. Yeah, I I think this album definitely deserves a lot more recognition for the bands in the band's discography. Um, with Dookie, I think it's just as good. I really like a lot of these songs and the uh the c- continual improvement of like the the band's chemistry with each other. Yeah. Yeah. I well. And it sounds like uh, their producer, just looking it up right now, the producer who did Dookie also did Insomniac, Nimrod, 
American Idiot, and then Bill oh yeah, Bob Rob Cavallo, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's not so that he I was know. with them for so long. Yeah, he's all, I think he, I believe he's also done work with uh Paramore on their uh, fourth album, the uh, Brand New Eyes. I believe he worked uh produced for that album as well. Okay, yeah. yeah that makes so sense. He, so yeah, he's been in the uh, rock producing game for a while, so like he he does some good stuff. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I'm trying to think of it, um I guess I don't, I don't know if this is controversial or not, but, like, my my mom's been showing me a lot of, like, old rap, um, like, with um, Ice T and Common. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't like it. I, okay. I, I'm not a big fan of it. I, for Ice T, he, I don't, I don't know, his flows just sound cheesy to me. Yeah. I, it, and that, that is something difficult about both EDM and rap is that the the style of it and what's cool about it changes so often and andre 3000 said this thing a, a, a while ago about like why doesn't he do hip-hop anymore and he's like because it part of the word is hip you have to be young and new and good yeah. and it has to be of now and so like so things do look corny as you go back but I would agree. I think that there are people doing it better, even in that era, that yeah. hold up more. You know, like nobody's, uh, you know, going out and saying like Black Star sounds cheesy. That record still sounds as viable today as it did in right. two thousand. You know, when it came out, and you know, it, 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 it is funny because I mean the same thing with Public Enemy. Even though, even though Public Enemy is like super eighties style, it's not hip anymore. Yeah, it still sounds classic. It still sounds good. You know. For sure. That's, that's really funny how Common and, and yeah. Ice-T. Uh, yeah, like, I, for, yeah, I don't know. Common, to me, sounds like he sounds like someone at a slam poetry club trying to catch up to a beat. That makes sense. That you makes know? total sense. Like, I mean, that, but that's the thing is I feel like it's before that existed, before slam poetry existed. So, like, I feel like that's that style comes from him in a lot yeah. of ways. But... Yeah, once you've heard that a bunch, you yeah, know what I just, mean. Like, it yeah. kind of becomes a lot more null to that sound. Right, yeah. right, yeah. This is developed. You know, it's you know, it's the same reason why like um, uh, nobody can hear a uh, a New Jack Swing song like Bobby Brown song or like even Michael Jackson of that era. If you did that kind of stuff now with like the orchestra hits like Poison, yeah, yeah if, if you did that now, it would sound either throwback or it would sound outdated. It yeah. could never sound, like, viable again. So right, like how do it you, doesn't you know, match the current you, sound. Right, how do you build that when you do something that is so of uh, one thing? And, um, you know, of course, rock has that too, but most of the time rock goes back to its, like, roots to do something classic sounding, which is just longer ago. So I'm, I'm curious in like 20 more years, if hip hop will go back to what it was doing in the eighties to sound yeah. more classic or if, you know, cause the eighties are, you know, eighties, fifties parallel in multiple ways, but with hip hop, especially because it was, the, and, and rock and roll, because it was the birth of both of those things really yeah. coming together, you know, sure. It existed like in the back shadows then. or in some sort of thing in the seventies and, uh, for hip hop a little bit in the late seventies and for rock and roll in the late forties. But like, really you didn't see those styles cement into something that had a name until like mid fifties for rock mid eighties or early eighties for, for rap. Yeah, like I, I definitely could see like we. There are artists out there that try uh, are emulating the sound, like um, uh, Joey Badass. Nas is still doing his thing. Logic mm -hmm. has been emulating that sound. So I definitely think there is an audience for for that particular sound. Now, I do possibly that it it could make a comeback, but I think now a lot of there are a lot of audiences that not looking for the lyrical miracle stuff and just want to turn up. Like even yeah. and even yeah. and even then like. Stuff like Migos that once were like super big, like right. now just kind of like fading off. No one cares. Like, yeah, no one cares. Like SoundCloud rap was like super big. Um, yeah, like X, uh, Ski Mask, um, Lil Xan, stuff like artists like that were once super big, like just kind of falling off after that oh, point. Yeah. yeah, so like I definitely. Well, certainly. Yeah, like so I, I definitely think like, it definitely depends on like what sound people are gravitating towards in that moment. Rather than something that that would just like 
permanently stick with something. Yeah, it's sound bites versus you know a, a classic sound, and yeah, um, I don't know. That's why I will always and continue forever listening to Mad Villainy by Mad Villain because yes. it hits every every time you know, point that I need. Yeah, exactly. Yes, it, it's like oh, this is what I'm in the mood for always. <laughs> yes, Raid is my favorite song on that album. Oh it's God. so good. I love so that piano good. job. <laughs> Yes, all ca- yep. yeah, that one, all caps. Uh, I mean, accordion. Just so oh, first like forty and first and last step to play yourself like yourself accordion. Like accordion. Yes. Yeah. Oh, it's oh, yeah. so I love that bar so much. <laughs> so good. Oh, yeah. I've been listening to a lot of MF Doom uh, during co- uh, during my classes and just going back listening to his discography because mm-hmm. I'd gotten into him uh, around when I first discovered uh, found out about Gorillas. And I, oh, uh, yeah. November has come. It's like, oh, I like this guy. Oh, yep. I like this rapper voice. Uh, I want to check out his stuff. So I listened to Mmm Food, and uh, I think it was uh, uh, the uh, it was Ho Cakes. Uh, yeah, the bi- oh, Super. Super. yes. <laughs> What's me to do? I I love, love that. Love that album and that was my introduction as well was was gorillas and then leading into that and then obviously the danger doom which it, to oh. me, I, i've tried to listen to it again and there's so even back then it annoyed me how many cartoon networks yeah adult swim there. stuff is in there yeah yeah and i don't mind you know i love adult swim and i love those characters so yeah i love aqua team when i'm listening right but i want to hear them when i'm listening yeah to that's like I'm, I'm of doom working with danger mouse <laughs> yeah i don't like I like the idea of danger of MF Doom rapping with Meatwad, but I actually wouldn't want to hear it. <laughs> Can we have a version without, please? <laughs> Where's my Aqua Teen rap soundtrack? Oh my gosh! Oh. Right? <laughs> yeah, I agree. I definitely felt like Masking the Mouse is a really cool idea of it, but I definitely feel like it's a lot more low key, more so an advertisement rather than an actual body of work. That being yeah. said, the track with Ghostface Killer on it is so good. I like that track. Oh, definitely. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's great stuff all over. Yeah, yeah. for sure. But I definitely feel like it's a lot more of a product of its time more so than like an actual piece of work. Oh, like, it was it was essentially a promotional album that yeah, was huge. Yeah, because like yeah. I know Adult Swim <laughs> put them together. It's like hey, uh, make something. The uh, here's here's Aqua Teen, and then there's a. Uh, I think he was on a, a Adult Swim. Uh, M of Doom was on an Adult Swim show. He was like a draft character. Okay. <laughs> I forgot what the name of the show is. I think it was it was Mad Something, but like, I forgot what it was called. He was like a draft on the show. Oh my gosh! Yeah, I don't I, remember that. That's amazing. Yeah, I had no idea. Like I I I, I watched some uh, looked up something about it, and like it was like had it references in between with stuff, and I. I did. I, I started watching Aqua oh, Teen. Oh, he's on Perfect Hair Forever. He's Perfect Sherman Hair. the Giraffe. Yes, yeah. that's what it was. Sherman the Giraffe. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I, th- <laughs> it's like what a what a weird character. But I played a giraffe. Yeah, on one of the weirdest shows I've ever seen. I love that. That makes me so happy. I know that's saying a lot, <laughs> considering it's a, yep. it is Adult Swim, literally the ground of weird cartoons. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this one stands out, though, for sure, as being very strange. Very surreal. <laughs> 12 Ounce Mouse vibes with it. 12 Ounce Mouse, for sure, one of my favorites. Uh, I love that show. For sure. I... Uh, so strange. <laughs> <laughs> Do you imagine if, like, they made a sequel to that album, and it was just, like, they added Boondocks and, like, Rick and Morty onto it? <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean... It actually, they might be able to do it a little more tasteful, but it would also, it would be the same thing where you yeah. just have a bunch of sketches. I mean, that's that's another weird thing I was even talking about the other day about like 90s hip hop stuff and even like the most popular stuff had like 25 tracks on it and like half of them were sketches. Like yes, skits. literally like, Eminem albums were, here? right, literally half of Eminem albums are just skits in between stuff. That was just a thing. And then, you know, that was a big thing that, um, uh, Dr. Dre did and Master P and they, yeah. you know, they, and like anybody that they produced also the CDs were these like weird plastic, like bright colored plastic cases. They didn't yeah. look like normal CD cases. It was always so strange because it was stuff I never knew because again, MTV crowd and it, just everybody else knew 
in the 90s and i would just see these <laughs> things and like be like what is this what look is at the track going? listing i'm like what is this a comedy <laughs> record <laughs> like it's so weird it is weird like i um i tried to um uh, i on a, I really like the um, a common album that was uh, oh, it was uh, B, like the production on that album is so good, like yeah. it's so good, it's so clean sounding, and then Common's like poetry slam flow comes through <laughs> on these tracks, and it's like ah oh, man, can, can I just listen to this? Can I just <laughs> instrumental please? I don't want to hear about like spirituality on this thing. I just want to flow with the violins, man. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure he has better. He's gotten better, you know. I I haven't. I the la- latest common song that I I heard at work. It was something with him and Lenny Kravitz oh, that he did. Weird. Yeah, it was it was an interesting song. I liked. I I definitely thought it was. Definitely the best common song that I've heard, but like literally every other song, it was like I was more enthralled with, like, in, uh, I was more uh, attached to the production of it more so than like yeah. the lyrics themselves, which which are good lyrics. I I've tried to follow along with it, but like I don't know, it's just something about the way he flows. It's just like I feel like I should be like snapping afterwards. It's just like it's just like a huge downer. Like you're expected to be at a club and you turn around and everybody's just drinking coffee and sitting down. <laughs> right? Yeah. Just right. wearing barrettes in the background. Just yeah, it's so deep, man. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but yeah, I I I don't know if that's a, like a hot take or not. But you know, I. <laughs> but yeah, I. Yeah, I I definitely am very much in like when if it's song like, it, like takes me in with like the like a few minutes with like an interesting production choice like that that like hook me into it like that's how i know like a song is going to stay with me for a while especially oh, yeah. especially if a song has strings i'm a sucker for like adding orchestral elements into songs oh. like that's that's my musical kryptonite i am here for that like that's just, awesome that's yeah. great i love stuff like that too but you know it Again, like growing up, like in the era I did with like REM and a lot of stuff like that, a lot of music just had that, you know, like yeah. because it was, it had just come back in vogue again. And then now, and then it kind of went away, you know, like I, I remember even like in, you know, like eighth grade or something when uh, the Goo Goo Dolls came out with the song um, uh, like Iris and it has this huge like orchestra. Dun, 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 yeah. It was like a huge deal. Like, and now it's like, again, very fairly commonplace you know but um no i i love hearing those kind of orchestral touches to things especially music that doesn't normally have it you know adding something like that adding something with like a real organic room sound to something that's pulled from samples is really cool yeah create uh, um, yeah go ahead sorry <laughs> no I'm, I'm sorry i was gonna say yeah like create digging through like the most random sounds that you could like think of that like you on its own like you would never expected it to how blend in nicely with everything but like when you add it onto it and it just just works so well oh yeah yeah oh, for sure because uh, like i um uh, it was one song i um oh uh slick like rick uh um it was a uh, uh like chill like that um by uh diggable planet diggable planet yeah and they and they had this like the clink 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 think 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 yeah. part in the bridge yeah. of the song and it's like oh what is happening? <laughs> what like yeah. I didn't I didn't know what it was, but apparently like it was a there's uh, they're referencing this slam poetry group, uh, and like that was one of their songs that they had, and that was like kind of their homage to that group. I don't remember what the name of it was, but oh, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. No, I love Diggable Planets are so amazing. Yes, so and good. I'm like, I like so much of their stuff, you know, like uh, where I'm from, you know, it's all playing into the mythology of them being these like bug, like these yeah, beetles these li- and stuff from uh, different mecha planets, bugs, you know? like, yeah, right, butterfly, yeah, exactly. yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's purple when it's snow. You know, like, I'm just like, I, I'm like, what? Really? Oh, good for you <laughs> then. You know? I guess on that planet it is. You know? <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll take your word for it. <laughs> Yeah, I love the group. I felt I definitely felt like they're one of the very rare groups where like their follow-up album is better than the first yep. one. 
Like, oh, it's, yeah. Like, cause Black they're, home, so good. Yes, Nickel Bag of Funk is so good. I love that mm-hmm. track so mm-hmm. much. Yeah, it, I kind of feel the same. Like, and I definitely feel like, like, yeah, their breakup didn't feel... Like, it's, it, it is sad that, they, that they're not really doing music anymore together, but it, it felt like they were like, yeah, like, we... we we're not, we're doing our own thing, you know. It's not we don't. There's no bad blood. There's no bad blood with it or anything. We just want right. to do our own thing, live our own lives. Like I respect that. With, yeah. Compared and to what... Outcast, that just like dropped off the face of the earth. <laughs> just yep. stopped doing anything after Idle Wild. Idle Wild. Idle Wild, which was you know that's one of those things that they pushed so hard and then was kind of a disappointment because. Yeah. You know, every single move that Outcast made became bigger and bigger until yeah. they kind of peaked, and then it was like, all right, but the next thing's going to be even bigger, and then it, it couldn't this, be. You could you yeah. couldn't be bigger than the unpredictable hit of "Hey Ya" that exactly. it, like, still gets played constantly. Yeah, like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like even I still hear like the way you move at my work every now and then. Bum, 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 bum. <laughs> yeah, my mom. Um, like we were listening to a uh, earth, wind and fire song. Um, and it had, um, sleepy Brown on it who did the hook for that. And she thought it was earth, wind and fire. Like she sounded so oh much like gosh. the high pitched voice guy in the group. She's like, it's, no, it's, it's, it's sleepy Brown. It's like, she's like, nah, no, it's not. It's like, yeah, it is. It's the same guy. And I played her way you move. And it's like, and she's like, Oh, I thought it was. I thought it was the the. I thought it was Earth, Wind, and Fire. Earth, Wind, and Fire. If, if you were to tell me that was Earth, Wind, and Fire, I would not have believed you. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I yeah, I really, really um, like the. I think Aquaman. Uh, uh, yeah, Aquaman is like their. I think it's their personal peak, in terms of like okay. their style. I I think this is like some of their best production, um, with the Return of the G, the start of. Uh, the Art of Storytelling, Parts 1 and 2. The title track. V- oh, verse 3 on Aqua Mini. Andre's verse is so fantastic. It's so good. I love it. I think... Yeah, I firstly think like it's their best sounding album for sure. And like this... So I don't even know if I've heard that one. Because Ooh. I've listened to... You know, I always want to call it Atlians or Atlians oh, or yeah, that... Atlanteans, you know, but, <laughs> Atlanteans. But Atlanteans, because yeah. it, it's Atlanta, ATL. So and then That's so a, Atlanteans, you know, uh, but, which Aquaman. almost sounds like they're from Atlantis, right? Yeah, exactly. it's Aquaman, Aquaman, Aquaman just so. beating the bad guys to Atlians. <laughs> but and then uh, Skank, or Stankonia, which so like I've I've listened to those and I've never listened to Aquaman. So oh, I would it's so good. The, ti- uh, the the main single from the album was uh, uh, Rosa Parks. That was, okay. yeah, that one's a really good one. That's, Andre's grandpa has, like, a harmonica solo in, okay. like, during the breakdown <laughs> awesome. of the song. It's like, sure, why not? Absolutely. You know what? Go ahead. Do whatever you want. Yeah. That is great. Oh, uh, it's it's so good. Yeah, I, I like, yeah, I, the, the first, yeah, the first Outcast album that I listened to was, um, yeah, it was the speaker box a little below, and like I list to listen to Andre's side of the album all the time. Oh yeah, and I thought it was like the, the greatest thing of all. Like this is like musical peak right here, and like and then like re-listening to it, then listening fully listening to like Big Boy side of the album. I kind of found out that I like gravitated towards that sound a lot more because I personally felt like um, it blended that style with like funk and uh, jazz yeah. stuff a lot more than Andre's did because Andre's felt like a, a lot more experimental with its sound because yeah. like it starts with like this beautiful like jazzy orchestral stuff in the beginning and then it goes into like like nice jazzy bops and then hey uh, then roses um and then um uh, and then uh, there's a skit with uh uh, Bentley Fonsworth and Andre talking British voices, and then the rest yes. of it kind of then the rest of it kind of goes downhill for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he really he really reached outside and tried to just do as much as he could because even Hey Ya was him trying to like do something like the Buzzcocks or you know like just trying to do something very um, punk. Yeah, you know? and and the fact that it's not punk at all and it's not hip hop yet, like it's not it, it's past that 
and a totally different thing. It's its own thing, you know, and yeah. I think that's that it's cool. And to hit that, I think he had to do as much as possible. Yeah, so. to kind of stand out from, like, differentiate what you can do in a genre and not limit yeah. yourself to that specific sound. That's exactly it. And whereas yeah. I think maybe with Big Boy's side, he was more trying to get um, the – the, the best version of, of hip hop. Yeah. You know, of, of what that he southern did. And, sound. And yes, right. Because infusing it with the funk and the jazz, you know, it's the same reason why I like the, the you know, a lot of hip hop of, of the late 90s era or because of Diggable Planets. They they really pull as much of that, you know, uh, yeah. style that, that people were, you know, the original you know, rap groups were, were taking those kind of sounds from, from a jazz artists and funk artists and spinning those break beats and things like that. So, yeah, I, I think it's both are really good. But I think you're right, though. And I hadn't I hadn't even heard a record yet that really encapsulated this because, like I said, I hadn't heard the one you're talking about, the uh, Aquamanista. But yeah. um, the the album with them, like Speaker Box, Love Below, because they're on two different yeah. They're not even working on each other's stuff. There's yeah. no collaboration. Yeah. So that's really an interesting album for everybody to kind of hear yeah. and be the most popular because it's not even them. Yeah. It's, it's basically <laughs> solo albums at it's this two point. It's solo albums. Yeah. yeah. Like, even, like, they, they will, like, briefly appear on, like, each side of an album for, like, a few songs at the very least. And then just, it's just, the rest of it is just solo stuff. Yeah. So weird. Yeah. What a cool move, though. I know. I <laughs> know. The last rap album to win the uh, Tony uh, to win a Grammy Award for best for record of the year. Really? Yeah, the very last one. No other what? album has won that since. That is so bizarre to me because yeah. we've seen a lot of a lot, a lot of Kanye and a lot of uh, Kendrick, um, a lot of Kendrick. Yeah. yeah, a lot of things that have been made bigger splashes but maybe yes. not commercially you know so. yeah but Kanye like, has it had to have made a bigger oh splash. for sure but yeah, yeah like I, it's just yeah it's just like apparent nothing really like if you're not it seems like if you're not like Adele or like the big mainstream artist then like you won't really gain that recognition until like you achieved a certain level well, pop. and that's what's weird to me is that Beck won a number of years ago for Morning Phase, which was an album that none, no other Beck fan like had really heard. Yeah, and it was an album that was essentially a sequel to his best album, but paled in comparison. It's like I know that it didn't come out this year. Just give the best album to that album he did in two thousand three. <laughs> that was really that one, good. That, that one now, album right there. Give him a little yeah. pity trophy right there. Yeah, and that now we can say that one was better than the other ones yes. that came out that year. Let's give a, 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 a reflective. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> For your award. accomplishments back, you know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but when a few albums ago, <laughs> yeah, you remember when, um, when uh, Macklemore beat Kendrick for the for best rap album? No, that's so ridiculous. It is insane. The, the grant, the, the Grammys are like, yes, the thrift shop guy is better than the guy that made, uh, sing about me, I'm dying of thirst. Absolutely. Right. See nothing wow. wrong with that whatsoever. And that's, that's not me hating on Macklemore. I don't I think he's overhated. I think he's a very talented rapper. However, comma the, <laughs> nothing not even close to topping <laughs> Good Kid Mad City. Absolutely right. not. And the fact that he texted Kendrick afterwards to apologize for it. You know, right? So he knew it. Yeah, he yeah, knew. Yeah. He knew. Like he knew it was rigged for the start. But Kendrick was being a good voice. Like, no, you you didn't have to do all that. You didn't have to apologize. Just take take your win in stride. Like you won, but at what cost? Right. Like no one even talks about the <laughs> their follow up album that they did. <laughs> like, oh which, which by the way, I I did enjoy. I did like the first, uh, light tunnels was a really good opener, and uh, oh. That downtown song they did with uh, they got Grandmaster Flash and oh, on whoa. yeah like it's such a weird song but it works so well like combining um, yeah just rapping about riding mopeds and then getting Grandmaster <laughs> Flash like white walls mopeds to the valley yeah you can't touch me and then 
getting this weird experimental rock singer to sing the hook and then making this grandiose Broadway sounding chorus downtown downtown like this like what is happening what is this song oh, too many things at once it sounds like yeah <laughs> there's so much going on like can, can I, I want to call a break coach you know it's been a pleasure being on uh, your podcast. Oh, for sure. Thank you so much for uh, coming on here. I really appreciate it. It was great talking to you. Absolutely. It's so good to catch up. We'll have to catch up uh, off mic at some point. Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Let them uh, let the public know like what albums, uh, what's your uh, project with your dad coming out and where everyone can find you. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, so new album is called Was, Was. That's the word was twice. Um, it is going to be available on all streaming platforms uh, as well as Bandcamp, which is a great way to support artists. Um, it is for pre, uh, pre-sale on Bandcamp right now, and that's just my name, Jonathan hape uh it's like shape without the s hape uh dot bandcamp.com or you can do jonathan dash hape.com is where all of my uh news and musics and uh goings ons happen so yes awesome well thank you so much man. i really appreciate it yeah thank you zach and i'll uh yeah this has been really really fun i have enjoyed just being able to kind of talk about whatever with you and talk about, you know, creative projects. And oh, stuff. of it's course. Great. It's always great talking with you, man. And thank you all so much for listening and make sure you tune in for next time's episode. We got ourselves an even bigger guest and even more surprises. Till next time, I'm your host, Zach Cobb. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. If you like it, make sure you like, comment, subscribe, and have a wonderful day. This is Zach Cobb signing off. <laughs>